You're listening to TIP. On today's show, I talk with Mark Ferguson about how he's flipped over 180 houses, sold more than 1,000 properties through his real estate brokerage, and owns more than 25 rental properties, consisting of residential multifamily and commercial real estate. I have personally learned a ton from all of the content Mark puts out, so I can't wait to share his knowledge and expertise with you all. I hope you enjoy this episode with Mark Ferguson. You're listening to Real Estate Investing by the Investors Podcast Network, where your host, Robert Leonard, interviews successful investors from various real estate investing niches to help educate you on your real estate investing journey. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I have Mark Ferguson. Welcome to the show, Mark. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. There's quite a few different things I want to talk about during our episode today, but let's start with your background and your story. How'd you get to where you are today? I'll try and be to the point because it took a while, but (laughs) I I started out when I grew up, my dad was a real estate agent. So from the time I can have my first memories, I remember going to showings with him, sleeping under his desk in the office, just being completely involved in real estate. And as I grew up and got into high school, I wanted nothing to do with it. Didn't want to be a part of it. I wanted to do my own thing. And I ended up going to the University of Colorado to get a civil engineering degree. Did that one year. Hated high-level math. Went into business. Got a finance degree. Graduated. And I couldn't find an amazing job that paid me more money than I was worth right out of college. So I went back to my dad. Said, hey, I'll just work part-time for you for a little bit. So I just kind of did random things, mostly manual labor. And then eventually I saw him doing all this real estate stuff, said, okay, I'll get my real estate license, got my license. And then he would flip houses once in a while too. And so I really started to get intrigued about real estate after seeing how you could flip houses and how much money you could make as an agent without being tied down to a corporate structure, without really having a boss or set hours. And from that point forward, I was kind of hooked. And so Really, it took me a while, three or four years to find success. But once I really started committing to the business, figuring out you had to work hard, not just show up, I started listing foreclosures, getting in with banks, and my career kind of took off from there. Then my investing took off and kind of fast forward, got to where I am now. What made you want to start with those foreclosures and those bank REOs? It was random luck. So I wish I could say I had some amazing insight, but I was actually on my computer and I got an email from some company that said, hey, do you want to do a BPO? I didn't know what a BPO was. This was like 2006 in that range. And I looked it up. It's a broker price opinion. It's like kind of like an appraisal, but not as detailed and agents can do them. And and they're like, hey, we'll pay you 50 bucks to do this BPO. It'll take you like an hour. I'm like, okay. And they faxed me the information, which was crazy because even back then, you know, faxes were going out. But I did one BPO, got paid 50 bucks. I'm like, man, I really need to look into this more. And so I looked into BPOs and I looked into REOs. I'm like, hey, BPOs can lead to actual listings. You can work with banks. And those suited my personality so much better because I'm not really an outgoing person. I'm more of an introvert, even though I've got YouTube and all kinds of other stuff going on. And I started cold calling banks, just calling up random banks to see how I could list them. I got lucky with a few and they told me where to sign up. And then things just started happening, you know, month after month. And at one point where we, Sold 200 houses in one year. So it's kind of crazy. (laughs) What was it like selling those types of houses? Because, I mean, in general, your foreclosed properties aren't generally in the best condition. And, you know, sometimes those could be hard to sell. I know I've looked at some, you know, REO properties that have been on the market for a very long time. So that could be demoralizing as a real estate agent. So what was that like for you? Really, it's completely different than normal real estate work because you are not just an agent, but you're the property manager as well. Because basically what they do is they send you an email that you have an assignment. You have 24 hours to go visit the house, see if it's vacant. And if it's not vacant, you've got to talk to those people who just got foreclosed on, try and offer them cash for keys, which is money to move out, possibly go through an eviction and manage that for the bank. Then you've got to possibly manage repairing the house, getting contractors in there, trash out, rekey. Then you list it. So by the time you get to listing it, It's kind of like, wow, most of our work is done. But yes, it can be frustrating because sometimes the banks want to list it for more than it's worth, or you have an appraiser who comes in who doesn't value it correctly. And there can be some, you know, 
drama there between all the parties. But overall, you know, we did a pretty good job of selling properties, getting them sold right away. And if we could kind of show our case for why a property is worth what it's worth, we'd have good luck selling it. So really the work of an REO agent is before it's actually listed. And then of course, if you get 37 offers on one house, that can be a lot of work too, because you're submitting every single one of those offers to the bank. But you know, it was a lot of fun. It could be stressful because those timeframes, like if you miss a deadline, they'll move on to the next agent and they could fire you just for one miss. So it's kind of crazy. Are you getting paid for all those things you do before the sale of the property or does it work the same way as like a traditional sale would and you just get paid a commission? You get paid nothing. You know, see the REO agent think they're making all this money and it's so amazing. But a lot of times we're fronting the expenses. So I've spent ten thousand dollars to fix up a house before for the bank and then submitting invoices and hoping they pay me back. Now they usually do, but what I always thought was funny is I'd have to sign up for their invoice management software. They charge me fees to get an invoice from them after I fronted $10,000 to do the work for them. So like, really? I have to pay a fee to get my money back after doing this? So no, we don't get paid for the BPO if it's our own listing. We only get that commission at the very end. And a lot of times those commissions are reduced, you know, not you know, what some people might say is a full commission. There's no set commission, they're all negotiable. But the banks will often pay less than you'd think on those commissions. That's really, really interesting. How does the bank decide which agent they're going to go with? I mean, I'm sure, like you said, they probably get a bunch of different offers. So how do they decide? It's, it's a lot of relationships. So once you get in good with a bank and you're in a certain area, they'll usually stick with a couple agents or even one, depending on how much work they have. So it's all about getting in with them, getting your shot and doing a really awesome job. And it's, some of it's luck. You know, some of it's just persistence. It's kind of a fine line between bugging the banks and you know, contacting them and letting them know who you are. And a lot of this experience, you know, if you can say, hey, I've listed, you know, with 10 different companies, here's my results, give me a try, that really helps. But really, it's just kind of getting your name in different systems. I belong to a number of groups like the National REO Brokers Association, US REO Partners, REO Network. And that networking with other agents helps too, because those agents can put a good word in for you, which is almost more important than anything you can do yourself. Now, do you get first dibs on those properties if you walk into one and you decide you want it? So is that a potential benefit of doing that as, a, as an investor and an agent? You know, I thought that would be one of the biggest perks of being an REO agent. And then when I got in the business, that is like the biggest no-no ever. <laughs> so <laughs> they are very clear. You cannot buy your own listings. It is a massive conflict of interest because then you might price it lower. You might try to get your offer in before other brokers. So you are not allowed to buy your own properties. In fact, as a HUD listing broker, and I couldn't buy any HUD homes. Doesn't matter if it was my listing or someone else. Nobody in my office could buy a HUD home. None of my family could buy a HUD home. It's just all prohibited because they did not want any conflict of interest. So it actually hurt you as an investor buying foreclosures. Wow. That is not what I expected. I certainly would have expected that because to me, it seems like... I mean, I understand the conflict of interest that could be there, but it seems like For the bank, it almost seems like if you have an agent that's ready to buy the property, they don't have to do anything. They could save a ton of costs on their side between administrative costs and then, like you said, fixing up the property, dealing with any other issues that are there. If you have an agent or an investor that's ready to just take that off your hands, for me, it seems like that cost, that opportunity cost for the bank is well worth it to just sell it to the agent. Right. And well, the banks, you know, in the very beginning of the housing crash, you know, they would sell properties right away, get them off the books. But towards the end, I think they realized, hey, we're losing so much money by not selling for market value. And that's when they kind of went to this process of mar- properties had to be on the market for five days before they looked at an offer. You know, no, none of our listing agents can do it. You know, they were very strict in all their processes on how they sold houses because they didn't want any kind of shenanigans between agents or you know, having low values to get good deals. And then they're losing 50 grand on one house. A lot of people assume foreclosures are just these awesome deals. But in fact, I mean, I can get better deals myself on other properties. So, you know, we've bought what, 75 flips the last three years or so. And I think three of them were foreclosures. With all of these downsides to being that agent for those types of properties, why did you want to do it? Well, I wouldn't say, you know, it was horrible because we sold 200 houses, you know, a few years in a row. And working with certain companies were better than others. So, you know, you kind of had to pick and choose the right banks to work with, the ones who 
you know, maybe paid more or had their own companies that rehab the houses. You see all kinds of different things. And actually working for HUD, which is a government agency, was the best gig I had, which you wouldn't expect, but they paid the most. They had probably their company did all the work. You didn't have to handle that part. And then they had an online bidding system. So we didn't have to submit offers either. So HUD had their systems down. Once you got in with them, it was great. You still had to do inspections every week. We had to drive by the houses, sign in, take pictures and make sure it's in good shape. But you know, once you figure out the system and how it works, it can be a great business. It's just going expecting it's not going to be a walk in the park and a piece of cake. So let's talk about an often debated topic that we've kind of touched on here about whether someone should get their real estate license to help their investing or not. As the managing broker and owner of a real estate brokerage, do you think investors should get their real estate licenses? I am a huge proponent of getting your license. Now, I know a lot of people disagree with me. In fact, I, I even had a question for the real estate commission on a legal issue. I think it was on advertising or something. And I called our local real estate commission in Colorado and said, Hey, you know, what do you think about this situation? And he said, If you're an investor, you shouldn't be an agent. That's just horrible. I'm like, Really? That's weird. But anyway, um, so a lot of people have this you know, misconception that you have more liability and you have um, you know, higher levels of ethics to stand up to. And they're right. And I have no problem with that. You know, I, like, why should it be an issue that I have to have good ethics you know, <laughs> if I'm an agent? So um, there is more disclosure. So some of the downsides first, you know, if I try and buy a property that's off market, that's not listed, I have to disclose I'm an agent. I have to disclose I might make money on it. You know, I'm very clear that I might profit from it. I might sell it quickly and I have to be upfront with them. And if you do it in the right way, that can be an advantage. I can say, hey, look, you can look me up on the Colorado website. I'm licensed. I've been licensed for 15 years. I'm not going to just disappear and rip you off. You can file a complaint against me if I do something horrible and that can build rapport with sellers. And at the same time as you're doing that, you know, if I'm buying houses from the MLS, the multiple listing service where you know, most houses are listed, I earn a commission as the agent. So if I buy a $200,000 house, I might make five or $6,000 on the commission, which means I can pay less money than other investors who aren't licensed and still make the same amount of money. So that gives me more deals. Plus, I think the exact number was like $280,000 we saved last year in commissions alone from selling our flips, from buying flips, from buying rentals, and commission coming back to us because as an agent. So to me, it's a no brainer. And the other advantage is I have access to the MLS where I can look up sold comparable properties. I can have all this access to data that the public doesn't have as well. So I have more access to data, make more money on commissions, can get more deals. And the only downside is I have to be more ethical and disclose more. So to me, it's a no brainer. Have you lost any deals because of those disclosures that you have to give to the sellers? I have not. I've never had a seller say, oh, I don't want to sign this because I'm, I'm not trying to rob old ladies of their houses. You know, We're very clear. We don't pay full market value because we have to make money. We're making a profit. Even if we're holding it as a rental, you, know, you will make more money listing this house in most cases. However, we can buy it faster. You don't have to make repairs. You don't have to pay commissions. You, know, you don't have to go through the hassle of selling it. Some people want to list them. And in some cases, we can help them do that too. So it's like, hey, we can also make money as agents. In other cases, they don't want to hassle. Or some people just hate agents for whatever reason. Even if they know they're losing 20 grand on the deal, they don't want to use an agent. They'll just sell it directly. So there's always those deals that'll work off market, whether you're an agent or not. I've never had a seller say, oh, I'm not going to sign this. How can you make money off this deal? Because I, I tell them up front, I'm going to. Yeah. I mean, every situation is different, right? Some people, they need the cash right away and that's their problem. They don't need to get necessarily top dollar. Maybe they you know, maybe their property is paid off and the ten, fifteen thousand dollars that you're going to give them less, maybe that's not as big of a deal to them. Whereas somebody, maybe they just need, they're selling it, they're going to buy their next house and they need the money for that and they can take the time to do it. So no, I think your point's absolutely true there. No, and a lot of people, you know, they have houses that need work or have problems. Like they just don't want it. They want it gone. It's like an emotional release to get rid of that house. And the sooner the better. And that's more important to them than getting top dollar. Yeah, for me, I'm actually a licensed real estate agent as well. I don't practice. I don't necessarily plan to anytime soon, but I got it for my real estate investing. I use it to, you know, in the same ways that you said, you know, save commissions and get access to information. And it also, I think it proves that you have 
credibility, I think, as an investor. So when you're submitting an offer, yeah, maybe some people might look on those disclosures poorly, but I think some people might look on it and say, okay, he knows real estate. You know, There's a point of credibility there and that could give your offer a, a leg up too. So yeah, I definitely think it's something interesting that people should consider. Oh yeah, completely agree. <laughs> so you've sold over a thousand houses, flipped over 180 houses, and you have more than 25 rentals. Where do you think new investors should start? And as an agent, as a house flipper, or maybe a rental property investor, where should they begin? This is kind of a, a contrary opinion to what is going on right now. But for most people, I tell them buy a house. And it doesn't even have to be an investment property. You know, there's this big push now to rent where you live, own, you know, rental properties, but a lot of people don't have 20% down, right? You know, when you're buying an investment property, it almost always takes 20% down unless you're, you know, doing seller financing or partnering, which can be very difficult as a beginner. And one of the best ways to get into real estate is to buy as an owner occupant. You can put three and a half percent down with FHA, three percent down with conventional, zero with USDA or VA. I mean, get down payment assistance if you don't have a whole lot of money. And once you have that house, you know, there's no reason you can't get a really good deal, just like an investor would. So, like we're talking about HUD homes, HUD gives owner occupants priority to buy their houses before any investor. So does Fannie Mae, so does Chase, so does Bank of America, all these foreclosures. So there's not this, you know, a lot of people have this notion, well, I'm, a, I'm an owner occupant, I can't get a good deal, an investor can. You can. Now you might not be able to buy that house that needs a hundred grand in work and is gutted, but you can get that house that needs paint or carpet and still can qualify for a loan. HUD has an escrow program that'll finance, you know, $5,000 of repairs or less. So you can go get that good deal, you know, pay a hundred grand for a house or, you know, 500, depending on the market you're in and um, walk into 10, 20, 30% equity right away. And then you can, you have multiple routes. You usually have to live there a year as an owner-occupant. So live there a year. After that year's up, you can rent it. You can start your portfolio with that rental property, move out, bought right in the beginning and figured your numbers right. You should be able to cash flow. You could live there two years, fix it up, sell it, and your profit's tax-free in most cases because of the capital gain you know, tax-free rule in the United States, which I think is the best tax rule ever made. And you know, there's such a huge advantage to buying as an owner occupant. You should not discount it. You can build equity. You know, I bought my first rental because I bought a foreclosure as my personal house. A year later, refinanced it, took 50,000 more out than I had into it, used that money to buy my first rental property. And a lot of people say, oh, you lose all this money buying instead of renting. And they don't know how to buy the right way, in my opinion, when they say that. So buying a house to live in can be one of the best ways to start. And I'm also kind of against doing the work yourself on houses. I don't do any of it now. However, if you buy a house to live in, I think that can be one exception where it does make sense because you're there. You know, if you're doing some work, you're still with your family. You're not, you know, spending weeks at a different house. You're under a time crunch to get this flip done in six weeks. So you can save a lot of money in that route too. So yes, being an agent can be great. Buying rentals can be great. Flipping houses can be great. But if you're just starting out, you know, it doesn't hurt to buy a house and get a really good deal on it to live in as well. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I have a lot of people that reach out to me and ask what I think they should do for their strategy. And oftentimes I'll recommend something like a house hack or something along those lines. But if they have a family, a lot of times either their wife or husband isn't willing to do that. And so then I tell them exactly what you just said is buy a property exactly like you said. And I think the key there is you just need to make sure you run the numbers and that it'll make sense as a rental. I think that's the biggest thing. But it's definitely a good way to get started. Do you think house hacking is another good way to get started? Oh, for sure. And I was going to mention house hacking and I forgot. So I'm glad you brought it up. But um, you know, that's one thing. When I started out in the beginning, I bought a house full retail, did it the wrong way, still was, you know, worked out okay. But yeah, if I could start over again, buy a multi-property, rent out part of it, even buy a single family home and rent out my basement. That's what my nephew is doing right now. That is a great way to get started. Because I think the biggest advantage with house hacking is that you start collecting rent right away. So when you go to buy another house, the bank might be like, oh, you have two houses and this first one you want to keep, like it's vacant. Oh, sure, you just rented it, but it's only been rented for a month. We're not you know, going to qualify you for a second house. But if you've been house hacking, you've been renting it for a year, you've got that income, it might show up on your taxes already. It's so much easier to qualify for that second house if you're renting your first one from the very beginning. Yeah, that's exactly how I got started. I actually house hacked my first property and then I eventually sold that. And then my second property was a live and flip for exactly the same reason you said it. I mean, it wasn't a major reno, you know, I mean, it needed some paint, carpet, you know, some exterior landscaping. But for me, 
those were super easy deals to just get into with three and a half percent down. And now when I move out of this property, it'll be, you know, a cash flowing rental property and then I can move on to something else. Yep. No, nope, great strategy. And then people don't realize, you know, that's another misconception. It's like, oh, housing prices only go up three or five percent a year. And that can be true. But when you're putting three percent down, you're controlling like a two hundred thousand dollar property with seven, ten thousand dollars with closing costs. So if it goes up ten percent, you know, you more than doubled your money. So like, you know, it leverage is such an amazing tool with real estate. Yeah, that power of leverage, it's incredible. That's something that real estate has that not a lot of other asset classes, you know, can take advantage of, like the stock market, things like that. Exactly. In a market that is, you know, arguably expensive, I think a lot of people would agree that generally across the US markets are pretty expensive right now. How do you find undervalued properties, whether it be for a flip or a rental? I think a lot of people say, oh, you can't find a deal now. And they're basing that on the fact that there aren't that many foreclosures and how easy it was to get deals after the housing crash. So I agree, it is much tougher to get deals now than after the housing crash, but it was much tougher to get deals before the housing crash in the last 30 years prior to that too. And there are still real estate investors that entire time. And some people got spoiled, I think, because there were so many foreclosures. But like I said earlier, no matter what market you're in, you're going to be able to find deals. And sure, they might not be as cheap as they were 10 years ago, but you base a deal off what market value is now, not what it was 10 years ago. So for flipping houses, you know, you base what your discount is based off current prices. If you're getting a rental, you know, you base your cash flow off what current rentals are. And it can be tough, especially with rentals, to cash flow now because prices have gone up a lot higher than rental property. Rents have gone up. And I found that in my area too. <laughs> and I think we'll talk about that, but that's why I switched to commercial rentals. So for flips, you know, it's all about just figuring out how to get that deal and really diversifying how you find deals. So we'll buy deals from wholesalers, the MLS, auctions sometimes. Sometimes we do our own marketing, driving for dollars, all types of ways for sale by owner, Zillow, even Facebook, we've bought a property on before. So it's just diversifying and really systematizing how you find those deals. And there will always be deals in any market. And a lot of times I hear people say, oh, I can't get deals in my market. It's impossible. You know, all the other investors are buying them first. It's like, well, obviously there's deals. Other investors are buying them. You just need to make sure you're the one who's getting those deals before them or figuring out how they're doing it. So you can get a deal in any market. Um, it's just a matter of knowing values, knowing the ways to get that deal and knowing your numbers. That's the key. I mean, there is always deals. There will always be deals. I agree. I mean, I think that the market is expensive, but it's just not as easy as it once was. You know, It's not like you're going to be able to go on the MLS or you're going to go on to Zillow and find 10 different deals that you could buy and you're going to cash flow $200, $250 a door, right? You're going to have to put in a lot of work. You might have to drive for dollars. You might need to build relationships and network for six months before you actually get a broker that'll send you deals. So there's definitely deals out there that you can find. It just takes some work. And for some people, like me personally, Maybe you go outside your market. I invest a lot long distance. So I live just north of Boston and we live in a pretty expensive market. And I was able to find much better cash flowing deals down in Texas. And so I do a lot of investing down there. And so maybe you could go that route and you could invest long distance as well. Yep, for sure. And you know, I thought that route too, because in Colorado, our prices, you know, skyrocketed. And I bought 16 rental properties from 2010 to 2015. And I stopped because it got so expensive. And I was going to go down to Florida and buy properties. But that's when I discovered commercial properties here in Colorado and that I could cash flow with them. So it's kind of like, yeah, you can. there's a number of ways. You can go to different markets or you can even just look at different niches inside your own market. We're going to move to that commercial piece in a minute. And I, I'm excited for that part of the conversation. But before we do, how do you decide between keeping a property as a rental versus selling it as a flip? Oh, that's a great question. And I get that a lot. <laughs> so right now, especially you know, looking back at how things have gone, pretty much any property that made sense that cash flowed and was you know, in an area where I wanted to keep a rental, I keep. So it's harder for me to find rentals than it is to find flips. So you know, if I find a rental that cash flows, it's in an area where I'm fine keeping it long term, I will keep it as a rental. For flips, it's kind of like, you know, I don't care as much about the area. You know, as long as I know values, I don't care as much about how old it is. So sometimes with rentals, if they're super old, I'll try to avoid them just because so much can go wrong in an old house. No matter how many repairs are done to it, you know, it will need more maintenance. And um, I'm not as worried about you know 
future economic problems or issues or how much cash I have into a flip. So I'm willing to take on bigger repairs on a flip too, because I know I can get my cash out quicker. And But in general, it's just if I can find a good rental, if it cash flows, I'll keep it. For flips, it's more about the profit potential. And I don't care about cash flow because we're selling it. And it's just between those you know, two situations. And really looking back, I wish I would have bought more rentals when I could, because there were some properties we flipped that would have been great rentals you know, back in 2012 to 2014. But I just didn't know prices would skyrocket like they did. Yeah, especially in Colorado, right? I think you guys have one of the, the most appreciating markets in, in the country. So definitely would have been a good time to get in on some of those rentals. Right. Yeah. No, my first rental I bought for 97000 in 2010 and literally put $2,500 of work into it. And I just sold it for 275000 and did a 1031 exchange into a commercial property. But yeah, our median price in 2012 was 110000 And now it's over 300000 here. So it's been crazy. Let's talk about your transition to commercial from residential. Why did you want to make that transition? Really, it wasn't something I planned on or really you know, had this epiphany like, oh, I need to do commercial. Like I said, I was kind of trying to figure out where I could buy more rentals, went down to Florida, found some decent areas. And then on the MLS, I saw a really cheap property pop up. So you know, this is you know, when most houses are 200000 at least, I saw a property pop up for one ten. Like, oh man, that's cheap. And I saw it's commercial. I'm like, oh, I don't really want commercial. Well, I'll just check it out and see. So I looked it up. It's like 3,000 square feet, a furniture restoration building. And I just kept looking at it. I'm like, man, this thing is so cheap compared to houses. It doesn't look like it's in horrible shape. It's occupied right now. I'm going to go look at it. So I went and looked at it, kind of started learning how market rents worked with commercial properties, looked at similar properties for rent. I'm like, this thing should rent for 1500 on the worst day of the year, you know, in a blizzard when nobody can come out and look at it. So I made an offer on it and um, full price offer that same day. And I didn't hear anything for like two days. And I called the commercial agent. I'm like, hey, you know, uh, do you guys see my offer? He's like, oh yeah, we got it. We'll get back to you soon. It's full price with no inspection. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah. They go, like, oh, okay, let me look at it right now today. They got back to me, accepted it. I learned, oh man, commercial agents are, they're great, but they're totally different than <laughs> residential agents. And we ended up renting that property back to the furniture restoration place for $1,500 a month. He's still there three years later. I think we had to replace the heat pump and the furnace and the roof, but that was covered by insurance. And that's all we've done that whole time. And actually, we refinanced that property and appraised for two hundred fifty thousand this year. So took sixty five thousand out, still cash flows, and um, just been amazing. And once I bought that property, I just like, oh man, commercial's great. Started looking at different deals, and we bought anything from you know a small eight hundred square foot shop to the sixty eight thousand square foot strip mall where my office is right now, where I'm at right now, and just ability to add value is just massive in commercial because you can add leases, you can add income, and it's really easy to figure out what it's worth based on cap rates after you do that. And then the fact that it cash flows because owner occupants can push prices up and pay more on a single family home than an investor would because they don't care what it's going to rent for. They care, you know, what they can buy compared to other properties in the area they want to buy in. Whereas commercial, you know, there's no real emotional owner occupants buying that building. It's investors who want to make money. Now, there's some that are overpriced still, but in my experience, you can get much better cash flow on commercial if you're patient and really look for those deals. And so when you say commercial, you mentioned a couple of examples there about renting to businesses. But so when you say commercial, you mean actually business type properties, right? Because in, in apartment investing or multifamily investing, anything up to four units is residential. Anything above that is considered commercial. So I'm assuming you mean more on the the business side of things, right? Not multifamily commercial. Right. I mean commercial. So (laughs) everyone's like, oh, you know, commercial investing. I don't, it's kind of like, you know, the banks have their commercial lending department where you get loans. And that's why people say, you know, a 40 unit apartment building or commercial. I don't consider that commercial. I think it's confusing. I think it's an apartment building. It's residential. So no, when I say commercial, I mean straight businesses, industrial, retail, office space, warehouse, not things that people are living in. So, you know, I have one mixed use property that is three residential units and one commercial. So I still consider that commercial and the banks do too because there's a commercial unit in there. In fact, that can make it kind of tricky to finance and appraise because of that. But yeah, I mean, straight commercial, not multifamily. Because in my market too, I looked at multifamily and they were more expensive 
even than the commercial stuff. So one thing about commercial is you'll find there's less competition there. I found there's so many less investors who are willing to jump into it because it's complicated, because it's you know, so different than single family or even multifamily residential properties. Yeah, I think that distinction between large multifamily, just the distinction between what commercial actually means is, is often blurry. So I wanted to make sure that we, we chatted about that. And to your point, yeah, it, is, it can be more complex. So how are you able to find and fund your commercial property deals? So I've found them a number of different ways. So like this big one was a, a pocket listing actually. So when I first started looking at commercial, I was looking at some pretty big deals. And even though I'd been an agent for 15 years at the time or something, I worked with a commercial broker because I knew I didn't know everything. And I knew there were some things I'd missed. So I worked with a commercial broker. I was happy to pay him a commission to find those deals and to help me work through what I needed to work through. And along the way, he brought a deal to me. It was kind of a, you know, a property he had listed. Amazing deal. I've bought multiple properties just from the MLS that were listed on our local MLS. You know, that's the other weird thing with commercial is some are on MLS, some are on LoopNet, some aren't listed, some are just sitting there and you try and you know, send a letter. <laughs> so they're all over the place. And I've bought one from Facebook was a commercial property. You know, There's vacant ones we send letters to. They're just all over. So finding them is you know, tricky because the ones that are listed on LoopNet often aren't the best deals. But if you can network, find off-market properties, you can get some really good deals. For those who may not know, what is a pocket listing? Basically, let's say I'm a real estate agent. A seller comes to me and says, hey, I want to sell my house. You know, Can you list it for us, put it on the market? I say, sure, no problem. And then I tell my buddy, John, hey, John, I've got a really good deal over here. You know, Do you want to buy it from me before it hits the market? And John says, sure, it's a good deal. I'll do that. So basically, the agent might you know, earn two commissions, one for the seller and one from the buyer. And he's selling it before it hits the market in order to get those two commissions. Ethically, there's some questions there. And in fact, Colorado kind of cracked down on coming soon listings, which are you know, meant to market to uh, potential buyers before it's actually listed. So agents will do this quite a bit to try and earn two commissions. But the problem is it doesn't always get the best price for the seller if they're only marketing it to people they know. So pocket listings can be great for buyers, usually not so great for sellers. And to get those pocket listings is the best way to build relationships with brokers through like networking meetups and things like that. Or what would you recommend to start building those relationships? Exactly. You know, um, just you know, going to meetups. There's a commercial meetup in our area every month. You know, you don't find as many commercial people in the you know residential you know flip or wholesaler meetups, but there's you know specific commercial ones. Looking up who has listings that are commercial, talking to them, having lunch with them. You know, all kinds of ways to meet those people. And you will find um, I think you'll find a lot more pocket listings, a lot more of those low key kind of properties in the commercial world than you will the residential world. Given that you had been in the, the real estate space for 15, 20 years by the time you made the transition, I think it was probably pretty easy for brokers to see your credibility and understand that you were serious about your properties. But how about somebody that's relatively new, has a couple properties or maybe 10, 15, 20 units in the residential side, and they're trying to make that transition to commercial and they don't have that backing? How can they show brokers that they're serious and that they really have credibility in purchasing those properties? I think one thing is don't be afraid to start small. So, you know, like some of the first commercial deals I bought were $100,000 when I couldn't buy a house for less than 200, which is, you know, one bonus there. But the other bonus is, yeah, the commercial game is so different. And it is tough to get agents to take you serious if you've never invested in commercial real estate, even if you have a bunch of residential properties. And if you just have one commercial property, that kind of like lights a, the light in their head, like, oh, okay, maybe he does know what he's doing. He might be serious. He's done this before. Even in residential, you see so many investors who want to invest who never do. And so people won't take you serious. So it's really just getting that one deal or you know, being willing to put up a little more earnest money being willing to uh, waive some of those you know, contingencies can help. But with commercial deals, especially bigger ones, I, I don't recommend that very often because it can be so complicated. Yeah, be careful with the contingencies, but it definitely is a good way. And I think when you're having conversations with brokers, just make sure you know what you're talking about. Use the right lingo. You know, Just show that you know what you're talking about. And I think that goes a long way for building that relationship and building your credibility. 
in a meeting to buy this big property, the brokers were, kept mentioning TI. I had no clue what it meant. And my partner was with me and he's like, what's TI? And I'm like, I think it's taxes and insurance, right? Like P-I-T-I. It's like, oh, okay. And then, you know, a couple of days later, the brokers mentioned again. And I looked it up I'm like, oh, it means tenant improvements. I had no idea what I was talking about. And, then, and so, yeah, knowing cap rates, knowing what those acronyms mean, tenant improvements, triple net leases, gross leases, just knowing some of those, yeah, it goes a long way. It's, it's a great suggestion. Based on our conversation, I think I probably know what your answer to this question is going to be. But now that you've done both commercial and residential, which do you prefer? No, that's, that's easy. It's commercial. So, <laughs> um, and one thing that I've been thinking about lately is, for one, you can scale you know, with commercial fairly easy. So you know, I buy one residential property, it's 2,000 square feet, maybe you rent it for 1,500. And it can be a great investment. I love those properties I bought. They've been great for me. But I can also buy a 10,000 square foot property, make more, have amazing value add possibilities. But the really cool thing about commercial as opposed to say an apartment building is with that 10,000 square foot building, I might have two tenants instead of 20. There's so much less management that can happen with the right commercial properties where you have five year, 10 year leases. You're renting to businesses that care. Like, you know, they have customers coming in their building. They have to take care of it. They don't want to lose their location. They'll take care of so many more things as opposed to a big apartment building where you're renting units for 700 a month. People are moving out all the time. You've got evictions. You've got tenants screaming and mad at each other. Just the management is so much different on these big commercial properties that, yeah, by far and away, they're my favorite. Yeah, that part about them wanting to retain their location and actually taking care of it because that represents their business as well. I think that's so huge. And you don't necessarily see that a lot in rental properties unless you know maybe you're doing single families and you have a long-term tenant. But yeah, in general, that's a really good point. And I think what also is great about commercial is the, the triple net lease. I mean, really, the tenant is responsible for, for everything in that case or, or for almost everything. And that's definite benefit of commercial real estate. Will you ever go back to rentals? residential rentals? Or do you think you're just going to stick through commercial? I will probably stick through commercial, honestly, um, unless something crazy happens and I can't get commercial deals anymore, which I don't know why that would happen. But um, <laughs> no, I think I would stick to commercial. There's been, you know, even if I found big residential multifamily properties, I've seen some deals come along and I've even made offers on them. But my plan was to flip them. Like my plan is like, okay, maybe we'll stabilize it. We'll get renters in there. We'll flip them because I don't want to deal with the long term of it. And they're overpriced, in my opinion, in my market for residential rentals and I think in a lot of other markets. So, um, yeah, I don't see myself going back. I have been considering going into commercial as well. One of my best friends is a credit analyst at a big bank up here in New England area. And so he deals with commercial properties all the time. And he's talked to me a lot about that. I see the benefits, I understand the benefits, and I definitely want to go that route. But for me, one of the big things that worries me is where we're at in the market cycle and just how small businesses, local businesses, brick and mortar businesses specifically are doing right now in the wake of Amazon and and necessarily the economic cycle. So what do you do in that case? And are you worried about businesses potentially going out of business when they rent from you? Or are you less concerned with that than you are with you know a tenant moving out in residential? That's definitely a concern because yeah, during a downturn, everybody has to have a place to live, but not everybody has to have a business. So you know, it can definitely have more risk in downturns. And that was something that concerned me as well from the beginning because you have five and 10 year leases, but you can also have one year between tenants. You know, It can take a long time to rent a property. First off, you just have to be prepared to know that it's going to take a while and that you might need you know, quite a bit of cash reserves. And then second, we try to make our properties kind of multi-use applicable. So like, you know, in my big building, we have a grocery store. So that's not going to go away, I don't think. I don't think Amazon will take that over. We have a dance studio, children's dance studio, a restaurant, a labor office for temporary labor. And they're actually moving out and the dance studio is taking over their space next year. And then my real estate office. And then there's a coffee shop as well. So kind of all those businesses are going to keep going as long as they're not, you know, as long as they're doing their management well with that Amazon taking them over. <laughs> um, some of my other ones, you know, are are similar, a welding shop, the furniture restoration store. So yes, 
you can see some areas where retail will go away. But if you look at the percentage of retail and what's occupying commercial, at least from my experience, it's a very small percentage of the actual tenants and uses out there for commercial that could be taken over by online stores, you know, clothing, electronics. You know, there's not, they're out there, but it's not like an overwhelming amount of tenants are in that niche. So for our buildings, we try to have multiple units, not have, you know, one 60,000 square foot tenant. Um, so try and split it up so that that reduces our risk. And then, you know, for our buildings, if a tenant does go bankrupt or they have to move out, it's not specific to their one use where we can only have, you know, that one tenant come back. We're willing to make a few repairs, do some work to get other tenants in, or it might work for other tenants just for the you know footprint of the building. So yes, you're right. It is risky, but um, there are some things you can do to protect yourself as well. And to your point, I mean, you don't have to accept every business that applies to, to rent from you, right? I mean, you could when you get those applications in, you could ask for financials, which I think mostly everybody will. So you can look at their financials. You can look at their track record. How long have they been in business? If they've been in business for 30 years, that means they've gone through two, three, maybe four recessions. So they're probably going to be okay in the next one as well. So you could take those things into consideration. And obviously, like you said, you could take the business that they're in and take that into consideration as well, right? I mean, a local nail salon probably isn't going to get overtaken by, by Amazon. So you, you'll probably be okay there. Right. No, that's a great point. Because when we bought this big building, we had a couple of vacant units and there's a laundromat that wanted to move into one of them, which seems decent, but they wanted us to spend like $200,000 to get it ready for them. And I'm like, I don't want to wait 10 years to break even on rent for, for what you're looking at. And then um, they didn't really have a track record either. So we just kind of waited. Then there was an event business, you know, having like parties or whatever that wanted to move into that space as well. And they had never done it before. They were starting brand new from scratch. And I'm like, Ugh, I don't know about that. So we kind of held off on that. And then a dance studio came. And just like you said, they'd been around 30 years. You know, they'd had a proven track record. They had a massive clientele, very professional. And we're like, oh, that's almost a no brainer. You know, they're moving into a better location than where they were before. I think we did like $30,000 in work for them. So that also kind of helps doing work for the tenant because it helps tie them into that property as well because you can customize it to them and they don't want to leave and try and find someone else to do work. And then when you're adding value with those leases, you can refinance the property, recoup it. It's really a fantastic business if you understand how it works. So what happens on the commercial side of things when you have a tenant that goes bankrupt and say you had a five, 10 year lease and they go bankrupt maybe year two, three, four before that lease is over? How does that work? Do they have personal guarantees in there? Do you go after the LLC? And then, but I think that would probably protect them from their personal assets. So how does that work? And, and what is really the benefit of those long-term leases if you have no you know, benefit of going after them in, in court when they go bankrupt? Right. And it all depends on the lease and how it's written up. So I think some would have personal guarantees. But I mean, my thought process is if they go bankrupt, you're not going to get your money. <laughs> I mean, they don't have money unless the company is going bankrupt for some reason. But it's kind of like squeezing a turnip. You know, it's not, nothing's going to come out. So you just try and focus on good businesses assume that once in a while you're going to have a bad situation and usually it's not worth the court costs the attorneys to go after them and that's been my experience luckily i haven't had anything too crazy happen but we have had a uh, business to stop paying us and we evicted them we got them out we moved on that's what we did and so if you have decent properties they should be pretty simple to rent again but that is a risk and you just kind of you know have to hope that it's not a big giant company that goes bankrupt because I yeah I mean they're lawyers they're, you're not going to get any money from them. <laughs> yeah, I mean it really just goes back to that screening process, right? You just got to make sure you really get the best businesses in there that you can't just like you would on the residential side with potential tenants. Now, going back to the residential side for a minute and because I know you're still doing a lot of flipping even though you're now in the commercial space, what role does the economic and real estate cycles play in your decision making when you're trying to consider a flip opportunity? We have been flipping since 2002. So we went through kind of the last crash and we flipped through it. And really, we don't change what we do. So a lot of people ask me this. I kind of posted a lot on social media and different things. We flip the same way we flip no matter what the market is, because I can't predict what the market's going to do. 
Like that's probably, you know, one of my number one rules when I start predicting what prices will do, that's when I really open myself up to risk. You know, in 2012, there were tons of people saying we're going to have another double dip recession and another housing crash. It didn't happen. And if the experts can't predict it, I'm not going to try and predict it either. So we always just buy with plenty of profit room, you know, expecting that prices could go down. You know, we can't expect prices to go up, expecting that everything's going to cost more because it always does. and Everything's going to take longer. So, um, you know, we can't push our margins. We can't buy, you know, mediocre deals just because we're short on deals. Just have to stick to the fundamentals and basically, you know, get things done as quickly as we can. So we limit our exposure, don't take on massive projects and have plenty of room for issues that might pop up. Time in the market is more important than timing the market, right? Exactly. Like some of my worst properties were ones that were just massive remodels and had so much profit potential, but it took so much time that all of a sudden it's like, man, I didn't even make any money. What happened? Because it's just so expensive to hold properties when you're flipping. So you mentioned social media there, and I'm glad you did because I want to I want to talk about that as we near the end of the conversation. And it's not directly about real estate specifically, but I want to talk about your approach to social media and just content creation in general. I know you have a pretty large following on Instagram, Twitter, and you have a popular YouTube channel. So what impact does this have on your real estate business? Why do you create so much content? Really, it was just randomness to start out with. I started a blog, investformore.com back in 2013 now. And things were going pretty decent. I was kind of like, you know, into a kick of, you know, having another stream of income. And my buddy who works for me now suggested, hey, start a blog. I didn't even really know what a blog was. I hadn't written anything for 10 years except in college. I just started writing articles and people liked them. I'm like, oh, this is kind of cool. And then people said, oh, man, you, you helped me do this. And it's like getting those emails where people said, hey, you actually helped me do something. Like you don't really realize how good that feels until you get one of them. And it's like, oh, man, this is pretty cool. So from that point, I kind of, you know, wrote more and more articles, had no idea what I was doing. And the blog took off a little bit. You know, we got like 100,000 views a month or something like that. And then I started creating books, you know, from that as well. And started the YouTube channel that kind of goes over everything we did. And I didn't really have any set plan from the beginning. It's just kind of learning as I went. But along the way, um, we started making decent money with it. You know, we started selling quite a few books. We have, you know, a few coaching programs, a few affiliates we work with. And it's become a pretty decent source of income for us. You know, I still make much more from flipping and rentals and everything, but it's kind of a nice side gig. And then, you know, you're able to teach people and help people. So on Instagram, you know, I spend way too much time on Instagram, but you know, we're, you know, it really shows I, you know, I'm creating my own content and helping people is my main goal. And then that really, you know, helps boost you up because it's not just the same old motivational quote that 10,000 other people are posting. And then people start to go to your website, people start to go to your YouTube, you know, they start to buy your books. And it's just kind of like a revolving circle where you get someone from Instagram and you introduce them to the rest of what you're doing and you can kind of build a fan base. And from that, not only are you getting people who might buy your books, but you're getting people who might send you deals if they're local. And it's like, oh, I saw you on this blog. I'm a wholesaler in Fort Collins or something. I'm like, oh, really? Cool. I've met a lot of people that way. I've found, I think, contractors that way who've contacted me from the blog and different stuff. So it's just, you know, just getting my name out there, it's hard to pinpoint exactly how much it's helped and affected me versus the time I spend on it. But one, it feels really good to help people. So even if I don't make money at it, that's a huge bonus. Two, it increases my network, which even though I'm not a huge talker, is still, you know, I know the bigger network I have, the better my business will be. And it also generates income. So it's kind of, Everything helps bring it together. And um, it's just been a lot of fun too. So <laughs> so do you think other investors should be active like you are on social media platforms to help them build their real estate businesses? I think so. You know, I know a lot of investors who don't have the books, who don't have the blog, who still get a ton out of social media. You know, I know a guy who's gotten quite a bit of private money. He's met wholesalers. And he gets buyers for his houses on you know social media. You know, of course, you want to you know use agents, list your houses there. But the more exposure you get for your houses, the better. You meet so many different people, and just you know, there's a lot of people out there who want to help others, who you can help, and you know, can kind of collaborate together to help find the best contractors, the best lenders. You know, so much stuff. And not only that, but by being on social media, you learn 
what other people are doing, and it can help you do your business better as well. Yeah, for all of those reasons that you just said is exactly why I've been recently increasing my presence on social media. Before I started the podcast, I didn't have any social media pages. I just I wasn't really a big fan of it. And then when I started the podcast, I saw people like yourself. I followed you for a while now, posting a lot of content. And I said, you know, I know this stuff. I can, you know, I could post this content and help other people. And just like you said, I've been getting messages of people that I've been helping and that feels so great. And so for me, I've been trying to do exactly what you said, trying to put out a lot of educational content, really just help people as much as I can. And if that leads to networking opportunities and other opportunities to help grow my real estate business, then then that's great. But just, you know, helping educate people is is so so fulfilling as well. Yeah. No, it's kind of crazy. I've had a few people message me on Instagram saying, Hey, I just bought my first rental or I just flipped a house thanks to your Instagram page. I'm like, really? Like, <laughs> I mean, I know, you know, I'm providing information, but it's kind of crazy that, you know, an Instagram page helped you do a deal. You know, I, I couldn't see it being a part of it, but people literally say, because of your Instagram page, I wasn't afraid to buy this house or I learned what numbers I needed or, you know, I just, I wasn't willing to risk um, stepping into the game and like, like, wow, that's kind of crazy. I didn't even expect that. So it's really cool. It really is so great. And I mean, you and I are connected this evening because of Instagram. I mean, that's that's how I became familiar with you following your page. And that's that's how we're doing this interview tonight. So it definitely can open a lot of doors in terms of networking and you really can help a lot of a lot of people. Yep, exactly. Mark, thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. We just discussed some of the social media platforms that you're on, but what are your handles on those platforms and how can the audience connect with you and learn more about all that you have going on? Yeah, no, it, like I said, invest for more is my blog and it's invest, the number four spelled out F-O-U-R-M-O-R-E. And for people that ask, that was all about getting more than four mortgages. That's where that name came from because I ran into that problem when I was buying my first rentals. So investformore.com is my blog. We have hundreds of articles on there, a free book on there as well. Instagram, invest for more is my handle. Facebook, the same thing, invest for more. Twitter, invest for more. YouTube, invest for more. Or you know, just search Mark Ferguson, I show up as well. So kind of try and keep that brand solid. And then yeah, we have eight books now on Amazon, eight paperbacks, and four of those are Audible as well. They're all eBooks. So I've tried to make those you know, as all-encompassing as I can. It's not like a clickbait book. It's an actual book that teaches you everything. So just try to help people as much as we can. Um, love to see people reach out and comment. And uh, I try to respond too. I'm not one of those guys who just ignores those comments and is just looking for the likes. I'll be sure to put links to all of your resources in the show notes. I actually just purchased one of your books. I'm really excited to go through and read it. If you guys are looking to connect with Mark, learn a lot of really good information, be sure to follow him on social media. Mark, thanks again so much for your time. I really appreciate it. No, thank you so much. It's a lot of fun. Great talking to you. Glad we did it. All right, guys. That's all I had for this week's episode of Real Estate Investing. I'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to TIP. To access our show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.